remind you that extremism in the defense of liberty is no vice. is evil genius Travis Cook back with you once again and we are smack dab right in the middle of Black History Month right now and as such I was thinking back uh, just a couple of weeks ago to Martin Luther King Jr.'s birthday that we celebrated here in America a couple weeks back and when that happened I noticed that uh, all across the fruited plain all across the country all across the political spectrum uh, during Martin Luther King's birthday there was universal praise for MLK and his legacy uh, through all corners. You saw practically anybody who is anybody trying to attach their cause or their political opinion or, or their beliefs to the legacy of Martin Luther King Jr. If you didn't know any better, you'd think that everybody in the world uh, would, have been, would have been advocated by Martin Luther King. I don't know how true that is, but everybody tried to do it. Everybody tried to say, hey, MLK would have been on my side. But I noticed as everybody did that, that, that all of the discussions were, were kind of vague and simplistic. Everybody talked, everybody talked MLK's legacy, but very few actually talked about MLK's legacy. You just hear people say things like, Martin Luther King was for freedom, or Martin Luther King was for equality. It was all kind of very vague ideas, very vague terms. No one really discussed specifics of it too much. There is very little real and genuine discussion and analysis of King's actions and King's legacy and, and the specifics of what he did during his life during the celebrations for his birthday. Very little real debate over King's impact on America. Now, to some degree, I suppose this is understandable, given the tragic circumstances of King's death. When anybody meets a tragic end, I, I suspect that it's appealing for all of us uh, to remember only the positives about that person and only their positive impacts on us and on life and on society. Uh, only remembering the positive that person did, even if sometimes it might require us to rewrite history a little bit. We don't, as humans, often wish to be critical of those who meet an untimely and tragic end. And, and Martin Luther King is not alone in this in this type of situation. I believe we as Americans, we do the same thing with the memories of John F. Kennedy. And Bobby Kennedy, you know, how many times did we had to, we had the 50th anniversary of the JFK assassination a few months back, and how many times during that, uh, those uh, commemorances did you hear people say, you know, back when John F. Kennedy was president, that was really the last time that America was unified, and when Kennedy died, man, everything just exploded in this country, and everybody was in each other's throats. Well, that's a nice story, but it's not really true, because actually the conflict in America had really started during Kennedy's presidency. He was coming apart at the seams. That's why he went to Texas to begin with, because he was in danger of losing in the 64 presidential election, which was unthinkable for Democrats back then. Likewise, with Bobby Kennedy, you hear people all the time say, if Bobby Kennedy wouldn't have been assassinated, he would have been the nominee for president in 1968. He would have won the presidency, and things would have been totally different today. Again, it's a nice, comforting story, but it's not historically accurate. Because if you go back and actually look at the 68 uh, Democratic uh, uh, run-up and, and campaign and, and run-up to the presidency, you'll see that Kennedy was actually pretty far behind in terms of delegates. Yes, he had won every primary to enter except one, but back in those days, the primaries only accounted for a relatively small amount of the delegates that you needed to become uh, the nominee. And he had a, a tremendously uphill uphill road to climb. He had to get Gene McCarthy to get out of the race, get his supporters over to his side, and then get past the first ballot in Chicago, and then maybe, possibly, something would have happened. But people don't like to talk about that. They like to think that Kennedy would have been the nominee. So we have this tendency as Americans to kind of polish up history a little bit when it comes to those who met an untragic end. I fear we've done that with King as well. With someone as historically significant and multifaceted as King was, it seems to me that it would be a bit unfair and certainly historically inaccurate to paint such a significant and polarizing historic figure with such a broad historic brush of unquestioned positivity. Instead, so that we may learn all that we can from history, it, it behooves us to put King under the same scrutiny, analysis, and discussion as we would any other significant historical 
historic figure. To honestly look at both the positive and the negative that King brought into the world and brought into America and to learn from all of it. That's what I hope to do here today. Okay, so looking at the positives and negatives of King. First of all, let's start with the positives. And there were some tremendous positives that MLK brought to the table. First of all, his message that people should be judged on the content of their character, not the color of their skin. We certainly all remember that message from the March on Washington, from his historic speech there. And that was a, a message and an idea that was long overdue in America. It was high time that we looked upon each other for our accomplishments and our contributions not for something as insignificant as skin color. King was spot on with that. Also, his message of nonviolence in achieving societal change was a positive. His continual courage in the face of seemingly insurmountable opposition. I mean, say what you will about the king. The guy did not know how to say no. The guy never said die. The guy would keep moving forward even when the odds were against him. Quite frankly, as a Republican, at least for the time being, there's a lot of times I wish people in my own party would show that amount of gumption, would show that amount of stick to itiveness. You know, when we have a debt ceiling fight or something like that, we could learn a little bit from King in that regard, I think. So there were clearly some tremendous positives to King and his legacy. But there were also, in my view, some negatives. And these are things that I guess people don't like to talk about, but I'm not afraid to talk about them because history being as important as history being the teacher that it is, we must be honest. We must analyze it as a whole. So yes, there were negatives for King in my regard. First of all, a negative was his advocacy for breaking so-called unjust laws. This, I feel, assisted the continual breakdown in the rule of law in society that really ratcheted up in the 1960s, but we still see it, still see it a lot today. It continues today. Now, make no mistake, I doubt that was King's intent. I do not think for a minute that Martin Luther King looked forward to a society in 2014 where people wantonly break laws just because they don't like the law or just because they think they can. I don't think that's what King stood for. But I do believe that his ideas of civil disobedience did start that ball rolling in that direction. Another negative of Martin Luther King was his advocacy for using the federal government as a means to enforce his views over and above the wishes of the individual states. This advanced a precedent that we still battle today. Healthcare being one example. Federal attempts uh, from Eric Holder, of all people, to incrementally give same-sex couples legal rights in states that prohibit gay marriage. Those type of things. You see, it's easy to get people sometimes to say this certain thing, let's say Jim Crow, is so egregious that we need the federal government to come in and overrule the states and force them to do things a certain way. But once you do that, then it opens up the floodgates, it opens up, opens up the door for everybody who's got a cause that they happen to like and they don't like how some certain state does something. It gives them all the ammunition they need to try and use the federal government as a battering ram. And we've seen that since the days of Jim Crow. Another negative of Martin Luther King Jr. was his public opposition to the Vietnam War. Whether you agree with the war or not, it's worthwhile to remember that to give ourselves the best opportunity of victory in wartime, you don't publicly state your misgivings about a war. You do that privately or you keep silent about it. Because when the enemy knows that the American people doubt a war or that they're pressuring their leaders to get out of war, it gives our enemies a tremendous advantage. In fact, there have been several interviews and several studies done with uh, people who were very high up in leadership positions among our enemies in Vietnam, where it basically came out that, yeah, one of the main reasons that they were able to last as long as they did is because they knew of the opposition here in America. They knew they could outlast us on the public relations regard. They were taking tremendous casualties from us. They were getting people killed left and right. They had tremendous destruction of property. They could not have lasted had we stayed in this war. We would have gotten the unequivocal win that we should have gotten. But we did not, and much of it was due to the vocal and public opposition to the war from many people, one of them being Martin Luther King Jr. But all of those negatives, to me, pale in comparison to one. As I did some research, as I looked at a little bit of history, I found one negative of Martin Luther King Jr. that appalled me far more than, than all of the others. We don't really talk about it much, and it's kind of been forgotten in, in, in some of the top-level views of history, but later on in his life, late in his career, towards the time of his death, 
Martin Luther King Jr. had started to shift his focus from the reasonable and overdue ideas of racial equality to the unjust ideas of so-called economic justice. He crossed the line from, hey, we just want an opportunity in America like everybody else has to, okay, we're being oppressed. And by we, he didn't just mean black people. He meant the poor. When he went into Memphis, he was Martin Luther King was just a couple weeks away from what might have been, had he lived, his biggest march yet, his biggest demonstration yet. It was something called the Poor People's March. Now, I didn't know a lot about this. Really wouldn't talk much about it in my history books in school or my college classes. But I found out a lot about it reading this book here. It's a book called Nixon Land by Rick Perlstein. Now, uh, Rick Perlstein is... Uh, a bleeding heart liberal. I don't agree with him politically, but in terms of being a historian, in terms of being an author, Rick Perlstein is off the charts. This book, Nixon Land, is probably the single best book I have ever read on the 1960s. You pick this book up and read it, you'll you'll learn more than you ever thought you could know about the civil rights movement, the Vietnam War, the culture of the 60s, every presidential race, every congressional race. If it happened in the 1960s, Rick Perlstein covers it and he covers it from all angles. He does a magnificent job. I can't recommend this book highly enough. So I'm going to borrow from Bo from Pearlstein's book here and tell you a little bit a, a little bit about what Martin Luther King Jr. is planning just a couple of weeks after his trip to Memphis. Talking about the Poor People's March. Quoting from Pearlstein here. He'd first thought of the idea in the autumn after the agonizing 1966 Chicago campaign. A general strike of the poor in the nation's capital. Quoting from King, we ought to come in mule carts, in old trucks, any kind of transportation people can get their hands on. People ought to come to Washington, sit down if necessary in the middle of the street and say, we are here, we are poor, we don't have any money. You have made us this way. You keep us down this way. And we've come to stay until you do something about it. What his movement's exertions had already won, the right to vote, the right to a lunch counter hamburger, had long ago begun to feel to him a mockery. King was clearly crossing the line. He had abandoned the understandable, logical and long overdue idea of, hey, let's look at a person's character and not their race. And he'd cross that bridge into the no man's land of victimhood and poverty. Not just about black people, not just about racial equality. Oh, no, no. This sounded a lot more like that income inequality crap that you hear Barack Obama and the Democrats talk about today. This started to sound a lot more like the crap that you hear about the so-called leaders of the black community today, like Al Sharpton and Jesse Jackson. You know, I never in my wildest dreams thought I could have put Martin Luther King Jr. into the same category as an Al Sharpton or a Jesse Jackson, but he's starting to sound like it right here. Going on in Pearlstein's book, the plan as it shaped up through early 68, was for the initial assault on D.C. to come on Eastertide. 100 leaders lobbying for a government jobs or guaranteed income program. My God, how scary is that? That failing, 3,000 destitute Americans would tent in on the mall. If that didn't get results, King imagined a, quote, massive outpouring of hundreds of thousands of persons the weekend of June 15th. Civil disobedience had never been attempted on such a scale to transform what he now called a sick, neurotic nation would require disruption as dramatic, as dislocative, as attention-getting as the riots without destroying life or property. So it becomes clear there that at least towards the end of his life, King transitioned from a healer and a advocate for equality, an advocate for racial 
equality to one of those people who were who were turning their back on America, turning it back, turning their back on on capitalism, turning their back on the traditional values and the pillars of our society. In fact, at the end of his life, Martin Luther King frankly referred to himself as a socialist. You probably never heard that in school, did you? Yeah, it's true. Now, we will never know how far down this rabbit hole King would have gone had he lived. Tragically, we'll never find that out. But I do think it is a little egregious to look at King's legacy as a very shined up top level view of, oh, he was for equality. No, he was for something. At first, maybe he was for equality, but later on, he was for something far worse. He was for income redistribution. He was for the victimhood of the so-called poor. And that's an idea we hear of today. We hear this from today's Democratic Party. We hear this from the Barack Obamas of the world trying to destroy the society that has given the world so much. King was starting down that road. Now, we will never know, as I say, how far King would have gone, but it is clear to me that, yes, there were tremendous negatives to the legacy of Martin Luther King Jr., and there were tremendous positives. It's very difficult to balance them both. But as with any other significant contributor to American society, and no matter who you are, I think you would have to acknowledge that Martin Luther King Jr. was as significant of a historic contributor as anybody in the 1960s was, anybody in the 20th century was. And in that respect, I think we owe it to ourselves and to his legacy and to America as a whole to fully analyze and understand the many various things that King stood for and to debate those openly and analyze those openly as we would any other significant historic figure. That's it for this week. This is America's Evil Genius. We will see you next time.